Hello, everyone. Hello, hello. Um, I'm honored here today with world-class leaders, in, uh, particularly in education. Um, if we have a moment, um, would you guys mind introducing yourselves briefly? Hi, everyone. <laughs> We're coming to the end of the conference. We're almost there. Uh, nice to see a lot of familiar faces. When the fog dissipates, I will see more of your faces. I'm Pearly from HTC. I lead investments for ecosystem efforts. I've been with HTC for the past 10 years, really started uh, even before we started investing into VR. But from day one, we knew that this would be a very profound technology shift that impacts humanity, society, our children in a very different way. That's different from prior computing platform shifts. And so from day one, we've been very passionately investing into learning, education, healthcare, uh, telling stories, arts and culture, things that will unleash human imagination from the physical limitations of reality. Very excited to be talking more on, to, on this topic today about long-term civilization acceleration <laughs> with the education leaders here. Uh, excellent. We're going to take over the world. Um, I'm Monica Arez. It's great to be here with everybody. I was a last-minute substitute to this panel, so just now getting introduced to all these incredible leaders. But I've really dedicated most of my career to figuring out how to build solutions for education with technology. So started off as an educator for 10 years with very early tools, but understood the value that Simula simulations and 3D interactivity could actually really help learning and decided that at one point I had to do that beyond the walls of the classroom. So I had my entry into tech first at Amazon to build interactive labs and then at Meta where I was able to lead the Meta Immersive Learning Initiative. So I think we're in this really exciting time right now where we know that the appetite for new modes of learning is really strong. I think accelerated in part by the pandemic and all that it made us recognize we needed with social co-presence and coming together when we actually had to be distanced physically, but also just because the affordances of the technology are really compelling for the future of learning. So excited for this conversation and um, to get to know everybody a little better up here. Thank you, Monica. Hi, everyone. My name is uh, Ilya Gogin, and I am the director of product at Pearson, where I head up an uh, innovation accelerator team where we explore how to productize emerging technologies like AR and VR um, and AI, of course. Um, and uh, so Pearson is all about uh, bringing life to the lifetime of learning, and I believe uh, VR is the perfect medium of merging the fun uh, and the outcomes uh, that you can have uh, by learning in VR. So it's great to be here. Thank you, Ilya. My name is Ryan Holmes. I'm the CEO of Space VR and your moderator for today. Uh, today our topic is about the long term of virtual reality. Um, in, in many things in life, there are cyclical cycles where things go up very, very um, aggressively, and then they go down aggressively, and then they go up aggressively. And so it's very important that you have a crystal clear vision of the long term so that you can mitigate these cycles. And I wanted to kick it off with something fun. Um, so I asked, um, oh, did they, do you guys have that video in the, in the, sl in the slide? <laughs> So the next slide is a video. Can you guys wave if you can play that or? Yeah, there they go. Cool. So this is a fun video. I, um, I asked Elon Musk what he thought about virtual reality and how it relates to space exploration. And so he gives a little note. And this was about seven years ago. So as you can imagine, we've come quite, um, quite a way since then. Can you guys? You just have to act it out now. Yeah. OK. Be long. Go. OK, cool. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, his Charade. comment in the, um, oh wait, there it is. Can you guys press play? <laughs> there you go. You can press play. <laughs> Maybe you can't. Startup in San Francisco called Space VR, and we believe that virtual reality is the future of space exploration, because you can put people on the very cutting, the very front of every uh, every exploration mission. Is that something that you've given much thought or have any opinions on? Well, I've I've gone I've perceived the virtual reality demos at uh, Oculus and at Valve, um, and it's pretty impressive. Um, you can sort of imagine if that's extrapolated into the future, it's really going to super feel like you're there. Um, 
And I wonder if some people are never going to want to take that off, honestly. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, it's like, it's pretty, I mean, it's pretty entrancing. Um, but I, I, I do think it'd be quite exciting to do that for a space as well, yeah. So that was seven years ago. So I, despite your opinion of Elon Musk and the latest controversy of uh, Twitter, he's usually on, on the right track with his predictions. Um, so our, our next topic is um, in 10 years, where do we see VR being? And that's really the long-term vision. So I'll start with you, Pearlie. Well, it's not just going to be about VR. It's all these immersive technologies and a lot of other technologies that we're excited about today, like AI, helping us create, helping us unleash our creativity, human imagination, all just fade into the background. That is if we all here, when we're building this future together, put humanity at the center and keep our children and our users uh, at, at the very center and design experiences accordingly. So in 10 years, we will be thriving in a way that we can possibly not yet imagine right now. I don't have a crystal ball. I don't <laughs> think it's healthy to necessarily make uh, predictions and, 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 and do a futures game. But, but I think that immersive technology really has the, has the magic of unleashing human imagination by democratizing access to amazing experiences. You talk about space, right? We were just talking about the overview effect. It's not fair that in the historic history of humanity, only a handful of people were able to appreciate how fragile and beautiful our planet Earth is and understand the one oneness of us all. If only all of us on this planet can appreciate and understand that um, from a very visceral level and it can easily be done in virtual reality, then we would have a much more beautiful place. We would coexist much more nicely, peacefully, with much more love together. Such a small example of what the magic of a transporting someone in to, across the context of time, history, location, putting e us into each other's shoes, what that can unleash in terms of better society, harmony, love, understanding, appreciation. And I disagree with what Elon said there. Uh, sometimes e e virtual reality experiences can be really fantastical, such as the overview that you can, you can experience when you are in space in virtual reality. But ultimately, I believe that these experiences help us appreciate our real life connections, relationships, and our real life existence that much more. And hence, it is a forcing function for us all to move into working with technologies, make our lives that much better. And we have tons of different case studies we can talk about, but ultimately it is how we can be more human and be more present with our everyday interactions. Yeah, we'll bring it back to the data shortly. Um, Monica, where do you see it in 10 years with your background in 20 years in education? Your <laughs> education takes twice as long. Um, I completely agree. I think ultimately none of us have a crystal ball, but if we can get it to a socially acceptable form factor where we're not distracted by it, it actually becomes part of how we're interacting and increasing things like empathy and presence become sort of foundational to how we're experiencing life around us. And I think it's also important that as we get there, I think we all know where the North Star is, but that evolution of innovation takes quite a bit of patience as we navigate some of the hurdles. We have to run over quicksand sometimes. We do have to go with that flow of success and failure. And I hope that we can preserve that space to allow that to happen as we get there. And as we know where we want to get to, and it will take time, that we use those moments to work on the design and to work on the, the experiences that we know will actually open up some of these new pathways um, and all the little components that we still know are those stair steps to get there. Would you agree with that, Ilya? I mean, being with Pearson, I mean, Pearson's one of the largest education companies in the whole world, and you're, uh, you're leading innovation over there. So what, what, are, what are you seeing in 10 years in education? Yeah, well, I think, you know, one must be, like, very humble about predicting uh, what's going to be like in 10 years, if, mm. especially if we look at the previous 10 years. I was not expecting that we would be where we are, mm -hmm. right? On the other hand, you know, I think we can look at this from the perspectives of, like, well, experiencing themselves, right? So I think in 10 years, devices will be better. We'll learn how to design uh, experiences better. So I think VR will be much more compelling, right? So that's one thing. Second, I think it will be much more uh, mature, right? So I think right now we're just like trying to do different things. If you look at so many companies, including uh, like the team that I'm leading, all we do is a POC, 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 POC. Mm -hmm. We're trying to figure out like what is this thing good for, right? And mm -hmm. I think 
as we go in the next 10 years, we're going to discover the best design principles, patterns, and best ways of, of applying it. And maybe final thing I'll say is more about like use cases, right? I think uh, you know, in the decade of mobile and web, we, we figured out what technologies are good for what type of problem, right? And in the last couple of years, there's been a lot of hype of like, oh, VR is this magic silver bullet, right? So I think in the next year, we're gonna become more sophisticated in understanding what's the good problem solution fit between different applications of VR or non-VR, uh, uh, including for education, so. Yeah, I definitely agree. Um, so I, I, having been in VR for almost 10 years now, um, seeing it from the beginning, I think one of the biggest questions that most of the most of the people I speak with that are outside of virtual virtual reality want to know is where is all the money being made? Where where are people really making money? And so that brings us to our next topic: profit. Um, really, do you have it? You must have the deep, money question. Our <laughs> our favorite topic, right? Into this. Clearly, we're at the beginning of the adoption curve. We all know that. It's no secret that it's a big, we're in the beginning phases of building out a massive shift of personal computing platform and how we experience our digital life. So I think it is a very premature topic to put, put top and center and say, where do we make the money? Because that's kind of not the point, is it? Um, so, so but of course, we've been investing in this ecosystem in early stage companies for the past seven years already. We're, we're starting to see portfolio companies starting to, to make respectable money, whether that is in healthcare or in training, learning, or in location-based entertainment, um, or in, in various entertainment, of course. That was the, what I was searching for. But of course, from a grand scheme of things, these numbers could still be small, but they're growing at a, a very encouraging speed and of course we know all the different issues in in you know looking ahead how do we encourage a, a more broader adoption of immersive technology and that will take some some patience but companies that are very focused on delivering value today to their customers and their verticals where we're seeing a lot of that is healthcare simulation, it's training, corporate training, it's productivity, um, it's, it's in therapeutics, it's even in mental health. Um, and, and of course, in, on some entertainment location base or at home, et cetera. Those companies that are very focused on delivering their product to deliver value today to their customers without being very distracted by shiny things whenever they come up in these hype cycles are starting to make respectable money and in, in, the, in the way that I can see financial sustainability and vi viability uh, mm -hmm. happening mm -hmm. in the foreseeable, very soon in the foreseeable future. Um, and, and of course, it's not just a money question of whether the bottom line is positive or negative, it's a trajectory of how much value is being created along the lines of impl deploying immersive technology. So if, if a, tra a training or a training saves 80% in mm -hmm. time or a, 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 a prototyping and design process saves 10, 10 times in terms of speed and cost, that's saving companies millions and millions of dollars. If you look at patient outcome in receiving some of the therapies that are already proven to be extremely successful, the impact on their life, how do you measure that? Of course, in revenue terms, it's already respectable. It's starting to go into some of the therapy market and healthcare and in the US and, and across the world, that's significant. But also, how do you measure the intangible impact on people's lives? How do you measure the impact on people, mm -hmm. right, people in veteran homes, mm -hmm. aging, becoming yeah. much more cognitively engaged and happy after experiencing virtual reality experience with their loved ones? So there's a lot of intangible value being explored, mm -hmm. translating directly into monetary uh, growth. But we're a little early to mm -hmm. only pick on the absolute number and compare that with the rest of the world. <laughs> thank you, thank you. It's funny how it, it's a lot of it's training, right? And even the gaming world, job simulator. When people aren't training, they wanna they wanna simulate their job. I think that's one of the top earning games. Uh, what do you think about the profit no, in VR? It's true. I mean, we're we're going from sort of the games and entertainment into where's the utility? And you're right. It's not just where we're making that money on the front end of it, but where are we actually changing the way that outcomes are coming on the back end? A lot of it is actually in safety and some of the, the trainings that happened in the medical profession that used to yield a lot of accidents and now 
through training in VR, you get the muscle memory, you, you can train with presence, and it's erasing a lot of what was once there. So there, these new pathways are opening up, but when you look at sort of the graph of where that money's gonna be, everything's still pretty tiny. These are early days. Yeah. A lot of these verticals are like in pilot phase. Mm -hmm. And so we might see a really incredible example in the healthcare industry or the training industry or the education industry, but they're one example. It's like one person's making a lot of money. Eventually yeah. we need the whole industry to see, again, the data, what comes behind it, where we're supported and why it's worth shifting into it. And all the predictions show us we will, especially along enterprise, training, education. Um, anything that we can now do with presence is also just completely changing mm -hmm. and disrupting how we used to connect people with technology. So it's, it's a question of patience. It's understanding where that value is mm -hmm. and then helping to support it as we get there and doing it responsibly. I think that's the mm -hmm. other strange place that we're in right now is it's going to take all of us from creators and developers and organizations all sizes, but mm -hmm. being very conscious of where we're moving those levers uh, mm -hmm. to make the right decisions. I think of anyone in the world, you probably have the deepest insight into mm -hmm. what some of the biggest or most profitable education companies are. Would you be open to speaking to those or? The landscape is changing mm -hmm. permanently. And I think, again, where we really saw a twist in education, and it happened during the pandemic, right? It's like we entered this global experiment to bring learning online mm -hmm. and recognize it was terrible. And so the, the solution became, how do we bring together these people in digital spaces with body language and passing objects to each other and a sense of presence? And so companies that started doing um, something along the lines of digital twin universities mm -hmm. where we could actually re recreate these experiences where you go into a classroom and it's live instruction through avatars. Mm -hmm. That alone increased engagement, um, attendance, mm -hmm. grades yeah. in a way that it's like, huh, is the solution to learning better really just being together? A yeah. And that was something we couldn't test before. Nice. So yep. students really having presence with the teacher was yeah, showing significant huge. data. Yep. And these are all little surprises. We didn't necessarily know that was going to happen. And as we start to put these experiences out and you get the feedback and you start to see these results and you're like, wow, we had no idea it was going to increase attendance. That wasn't even on our radar. Right? That is but a great transition to our next topic of data, <laughs> 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 the data of education. Um, so Ilya, have, have you... Uh, where, where have you seen the most significant data around virtuality and education? Well, that's, yeah, so that's a, you know, interesting question because like this, this field is still emerging and I think collecting the right data is still an issue. Um, I maybe talk about two uh, data points that are interesting to me. Uh, uh, they're kind of a little bit opposite of one another. Mm -hmm. So one, you know, it's more of a number I've seen recently is about the, just the, you know, the CAGR about uh, uh, VR, right? And that mm -hmm. the VR is the fastest growing uh, content medium, right? Yeah. Uh, being ahead of you know video, uh, TV, and things like that, right? So to me, that is very exciting because it, so it sounds like we've like oversaturated video and all the other media. Yes. And VR, there's still such a high ceiling to get, mm -hmm. which means we're gonna still see a lot of like interesting experiences in VR. Mm -hmm. The opposite uh, data point I've seen recently is I think it was about 3.7 billion people still don't have access to the internet. Hmm. Which is wow. kind of like uh, you know, <laughs> it's goodness. kind of the opposite, right? So if there, how many did you say? A lot. Uh, it's about like three point seven oh, billion, wow. right? So so then a lot. if we look at the VR space, yeah. right, and about like adoption of this technology, the yeah. some of the root cause is not actually VR or how clunky the it's devices just are, just people don't have the internet. Yeah. Right? So I think if we don't solve that problem first, it's, it's going to be point. hard for us to solve the yeah. other problem second, right? So I spoke with this gentleman, and he goes in Africa, and he goes to villages that have never even seen a television, and he brings like a full-blown, high-resolution uh, VR headset, and he just he says that people are just blown away. So, and it's okay to leapfrog, like yeah. in this day and age, right? If we find those solutions, yeah. another really fun sort of like design research type of stat is. People remember only about 5% of what they hear in lecture style learning. So you're not going to remember any of this talk as soon as you walk out. But you remember about 10% of what you read and 75% of what you learn in VR. I mean, that alone, and that was only one study. A lot more work has to be done in the research side. But that alone is compelling enough for us to really figure out how to support this at scale. Yes, I think Pearly had, you had some really great data points in your. Yeah, that, that's one of my favorite. That's by National Training Laboratory. Yeah. I think it's very compelling, but we just talk about surgical training, for example. Mm -hmm. The Yale Medical School had done the study that, that show that surgeons who are trained in VR make six times fewer errors. Don't wow. we all want that? 
I would uh, like that for surgeon. any Perfect. doctors that touch our body, yeah. open up our body. <laughs> and what is the impact of that on human lives and patient safety, right? Yeah. Um, and there's Miami Health System locally here in Children's Health System in Miami. They did a study that show on the long-term retention. Students that are trained in VR after one year, they still retain 80% oh. of the skills and knowledge that they were trained for versus traditional training, that number is 20%. So we have a 400% gain in long-term knowledge retention just by putting the learners into the visceral kinesthetic learning environment that is as simple as deploying a VR headset that can be brought to Africa or to any any rem remote or any kind of environments, even without internet in the mm -hmm. offline setting. But imagine as I'm um, sure and hopeful that as humanity will solve the digital access problem and what, what that means in 5G, 6G, enabling high resolution, amazing virtual experiences to go to those children in Africa mm -hmm. that might not get on a plane yeah. and travel to Paris yeah. or, or learn about amazing things that, uh, that the more privileged of us get to learn. And that is a level playing field yes. and forcing function mm -hmm. for good. And that's why we're really excited about the promise. I love how you speak the true voice of excitement. <laughs> you really, you spoken have, from the heart. You have an authentic passion. The well, other stat with that study, with the surgical training, was a 230% increase in performance uh, yes. for those that train in VR versus traditional training methods. So it's oh, like wow. the numbers are off the chart in all these studies that we've done. That's very impressive. Very exciting. 230% is a big amount. <laughs> and six times fewer errors. <laughs> <laughs> Next time, you have to ask your surgeons before they operate on you whether they've been trained in trained? VR. I can see the ads. It's your surgeon. Ask your <laughs> surgeon if he's trained in VR. Well, thank you guys so much for being here, and I really appreciate your time, and thank you for your Thank you guys for coming and watching. Um, All right. Thank really you. appreciate you guys thank coming. Thank you for your time. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Ryan.